Buenos dias. Welcome to another daily devotion. I am your pastor for today, Pastor Jesse. Welcome. I hope you are having a wonderful, delightful day so far. Today we're going to be in Matthew chapter 19. And I'm going to do my best to get through as much of the chapter as I can quickly uh, because there is so much here that is really good. And I, I would hate um, to, s s I don't know, sometimes you just feel like you need to get all of it out. And so today is one of those days. Uh, if you're new to the channel, welcome. Uh, I am Pastor Jesse pastor of Redeeming Life Fellowship, along with Pastor Dan, who you'll see, uh, well, actually, it was in yesterday's video. Um, you're welcome to join us live on Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings in person. Uh, contact us for a copy of the reading plan if you want, like, a printout. Uh, otherwise, you're welcome to just find out every day. Woo! Um, you're also welcome to subscribe to the channel, click the little bell, and you'll be notified whenever our videos come out. Uh, that way, you can do it first thing in the morning if you'd like, because they come out at like midnight, I think. Also, uh, I'm, I'm so glad that you're here. Some of you guys have been paying attention to these for a while. Man, congratulations. You're doing it. You're, you're doing these videos. You are studying the Word of God, you're challenging yourself, you're growing. Uh, here at Redeeming Life Fellowship, our goal, our mission is to grow mature disciples. And so uh, we, we all know, right, that we've talked about this several times before, but the way that you grow as a person is to feed your body, right? Uh, the way you become healthy as a person is to feed your body good, nutritious things. The way you feed your soul is through the Word of God, feeding it nutrition. And so here we go. Uh, here's our, our meal for the day. Matthew chapter 19. Uh, this is one of those chapters that... I think is like really heavy hitting. So uh, prepare your hearts, prepare your minds. Jesus, prepare all of our hearts and minds. Amen. When Jesus had finished saying these things, he departed from Galilee and went to the region of Judea across the Jordan. Large crowds followed him and he healed them there. Some Pharisees approached him to test him and they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife on any ground? So first and foremost, before we get into like the bulk of what this particular chapter is going to spend a little bit more time on here, I don't want you to skip over this. Um, remember we talked about how in chapter 1, Matthew chapter 1, uh, we, we I've said this several times because I think it is the theme that Matthew is trying to get after. Uh, and he, he says this, See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated, God is with us. It is important for us to recognize that Matthew is doing everything he can. Every story, everything he says is with the intention to convince you and me that Jesus is God with us. So God with us. Uh, went into the region of Judea across the Jordan, and large crowds are following him. Now, there's this uh, philosophy that would say that the book of Matthew isn't written chronologically, rather, but that uh, it's kind of split up into two themes, uh, where he's uh, Jesus around Galilee, and then he goes to Jerusalem, when in all reality, Jesus probably went back and forth. Um, but... Uh, the, this is one of those stories where uh, Jesus, he, he is, uh, he's in Galilee. This is important for us because um, uh, this particular area, um, you know, is kind of like, 
in, in, in America, you could say is it reminds you of maybe like Alabama or Kentucky. Uh, it's, it's not, uh, it's not New York. It's definitely not Chicago. Um, you know, they talk a little different, their accents a little bit different. Uh, the way of, of life is a little different. They're not fine and refined. Um, they're not um, well educated, so to speak. Um, but at the same time, at this particular time, they're incredibly well uh, off. They're very profitable. It would be kind of like going to Northern Indiana where there's a lot of Amish uh, and yet they're rich. Um, the Amish everywhere are not rich, but Amish there are very rich. Um, and so, you know, you go there, but the culture is very different. The way they do life is very different. There's a lot that goes into that. But what, what matters is the way you see it is like, well, um, they're just different. They have this different thing. So Jesus, when he departed from Galilee, went to the region of Judea across the Jordan. He He's going to this area where like the the more religious the more um traditionalists the people that hold themselves to the highest jewish religious jewish standards are there they are the pharisees um they are also um in in terms of authority probably the the more dominant um and so what's interesting though is jesus is, is taking the time to spend time with these large crowds. There's this large following. Jesus is creating a problem for the Pharisees because people are, are just in large crowds. Droves of people are coming to spend time with Jesus. Why? He's healing people. Uh, people are being set free. Uh, and here it says that Jesus, who is God with us, he heals the people that are there. They're coming, uh, they're being brought to him, and he is healing the people. Miraculous signs and wonders are taking place. Uh, some Pharisees approached him to test him, and they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife on any grounds? Haven't you read, he replied, that he who created them at the beginning made them male and female. So pause there. Uh, this is really important for today's culture. A lot of people aren't going to like this, but Jesus is agreeing with the Genesis account. Uh, you can find it according to this, let's see. Genesis 127 and verse, uh, chapter five, verse two. Uh, so with that, Jesus is agreeing. He believes 100% that the account in Genesis is accurate, that it is true. And he says this, haven't you heard that they were said that in the beginning they were made male and female. There are two genders. Uh, for some people, I, I just recently listened to a debate where the guy um, basically was saying, well, what is a woman? What is a man? Well, uh, you can play that game with anything. What is a book? Uh, you, you can sit there and argue, but we have definitions for words. And if you change the definition, guess what? People will use totally different words to describe something because... Um, when we're trying to tell you what something is, the reason you have a definition is so that we have a common way to understand something. And so here he's saying, uh, you've made them male and female. Um, two genders, it is referring not just to your sex, uh, your chromosomes, but all of you. Uh, if you are a man, there are things that affect all of you that make you different from a female, the way you think uh, the way you feel um, may not necessarily be the only thing about you that is a man. There are, uh, I've, I've heard several scientists say that there are at least 2,000 differences between the genders. Um, now, listen, the point of this is not to argue that because that's not what the question was. The question was, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife on any grounds? And he's saying... Uh, that at the beginning, they made a male and female. And he also said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two will become one flesh. Now, this is both referring to uh, your physical anatomy, 
right? When the male and the female come together, they form one flesh. But also, uh, it is more than that. It is spiritual. We, we talked about earlier, uh, probably, I guess it would have been either December or November last year, where we talked about uh, the book of, I think it was Malachi. Um, yeah, Malachi. And he talks a lot there about marriage. And he talks about this and how when two come together, they become one. And what happens there is that the spirit of God melds them together. Uh, recently, I read a study that, that was talking about some things that take place in, in your psyche that you don't even realize uh, that scientists are, are just now kind of starting to understand and discover. Listen, it's, it's a miracle. God puts two into one. And then Jesus says this, therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Now, I want us to understand this, that if like when things are melded together, they can come apart, but it is incredibly, incredibly uh, difficult. It is, um, can be disastrous. Think about it like this. Uh, this would, it would require a tearing for me to rip this to pieces. Now, this is a book for those of you who are listening to the podcast. Uh, th that there are things like, like when iron, uh, joints are put together when God melts that together or when the welder melts it together so to speak uh, it becomes one uh, but then you can take it apart again but it would require a severing it would require a melting again and that is a incredibly painful process you cannot divorce someone and it not be uh imagined or uh i'm i wish i was better with words uh think about it like this your arm is attached to the rest of your body cut it off that is what a divorce is like uh you are one you just separated it um jesus wants us to recognize this that just because you can get a divorce doesn't mean you should get a divorce uh, verse 7, why then did they asked him, did Moses command us to give divorce papers and to send her away? He told them, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because of the hardness of your hearts. It was not like that from the beginning. Uh, this is interesting because from the get-go, God set it up so that um, one man would be married to one woman. Uh, but then what happens, things get jacked up, sin gets in, in the way. Uh, and hardness of hearts take place. Uh, we are going to have to move on quickly. But he, he says this. I tell you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. Now, we've talked about this before. Uh, we also know that there is, uh, in Corinthians, there is an exemption that if you are married to somebody who is not uh, saved person, they are not a follower of Christ, and they want to leave the marriage. You uh, aren't um, committing adultery. Uh, that there, there is that permission also scripturally. Uh, but I, I do think that this is important. There is not a place anywhere in Scripture that says uh, that you should treat your spouse like uh, a carly's. In other words, I can just use them for what I want. And then once they aren't doing what I want them to do anymore, I can just get rid of them. There's never, ever that attitude. Uh, there, there is some people, there's a, a third case that can be made uh, where it's basically uh, a, a quick summary. I, I wish I was better at this, but basically um, there's a, a third case where uh, unmet um, marital obligations uh, a quick example in scripture of that would be like if you get married uh, you claimed that you were a virgin they find out you're not um, and obviously at the time that they had a way to test and there still is a way to test but uh, when it's proven that you weren't because you're not who you said you were you you were allowed to get out of that we would call that kind of like an annulment 
uh, today. Um, but basically, you were still joined together, but you have to be divorced. Uh, and so there are some people that we teach that that's okay. Um, you know, we, there, that's that. Um, also, um, in within that would, would fall into the lines of, anyway, that, that's going to get super blurry and we don't have enough time to go into all of it. So there, the, anyway, there's that. Um, the point that Jesus is trying to make, the point that God tries to make, and the point that is made all throughout all of scripture is that divorce is not something that anyone should treat, uh, take lightly. Uh, that once you're put together, God did this miraculous thing. He put you together. He molded you into one couple. It is worth fighting for. We'll just say that. It is worth fighting for. Yet your spouse, who is going to drive you absolutely nuts, is worth fighting for. Keep it together. Honor the Lord. Why? I think it's because it represents Jesus and the church. And that our marriages as Christians are supposed to accurately represent Jesus and the bride of Christ. In the way that he sacrificially loves his bride. The disciples said to him in verse 10, if the relationship of a man with his wife is like this, it is better not to marry. He responded, not everyone can accept this saying, but only those who it has been given. For there are some eunuchs who were born that way from their mother's womb. And there are some eunuchs that were made by men. And then there are eunuchs who have been made themselves that who have made themselves that way because of the kingdom of heaven, the one who is able to accept it should accept it. He's agreeing with the disciples when they say that it is better for a man not to marry. Now, listen, uh, this is a question of good and better. Uh, not everybody can. Uh, marriage is good. Marriage is beautiful. Marriage is a blessing. Uh, and Jesus here, though, is saying not everybody can accept it. Um, it's okay if you stay single. Uh, you see that echoed in 1 Corinthians as well. Now, this isn't to discredit your marriage. Please do not read this as a, you should never have gotten married. Uh, that's not at all what this is saying. Um, please understand. Some of you are, are watching this. Uh, some people just like, you know, um, have, have struggles with particular sins and, and for you in particular, it's way better for you to stay single. Uh, and that, I, I, I want you to know that that's okay. Uh, there are a lot of people out there uh, in our culture in particular that would say you have to be married. Uh, they're always trying to set you up with people. It, listen, Jesus gives you permission to stay single. Uh, then the children were brought to Jesus. Uh, for him to place his hands on them and pray. Now, um, this is probably not going to set well with some people, but it's with the rules that are taking place around the world and not allowing people to get together to follow uh, the Bible that you should just do everything online. Listen, you can't do this part. When Jesus put his hands, place his hands on them and pray. I can pray for, for you from a distance. I cannot place my hand on you. Uh, there is something important, the doctrine of impartation, uh, which according to Hebrews, right, the doctrine of the laying on of hands, uh, not necessarily the, the doctrine of impartation, but the doctrine of laying on of hands in Hebrews is considered fundamental. It's considered elementary. Uh, you cannot lay your hands on people, which, right, like if we're all trying to be like Jesus, that means we also should be praying for people. We should also be blessing them, laying our hands on them. You can't do that if you're always at home. The other side of that is you can't receive that if you're always at home. You need to be in person. Uh, but the disciples rebuked them. Jesus said, leave the children alone and don't try to keep them from coming to me because the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. After placing his hands on them, he went on from there. Listen. Jesus loves the children. Uh, Jesus rebukes the disciples because they are trying to prevent children from coming and receiving the kingdom of God. And, and Jesus is saying no. Uh, he puts his hands on them. He prays for them. He blesses them. And uh, I think it's important for each and every one of us 
to see the priority that Jesus places on children. Um, don't do anything to prevent them. In fact, if, if I were you, I would pick up as many kids as I can find and bring them to church so that people can also pray for them, bless them, lay their hands on them so that they can receive the kingdom of heaven. Uh, just then, and I, I know we're, this is getting long, if you will allow me, um, I can finish at, at verse 22, uh, even though there's so much here that's super important. I, I just, I didn't want to skip any of this today, I'm sorry. Uh, just then, someone came up and asked him, Teacher, what good must I do to have entered eternal life? Now listen, one of the issues that this dude has from the get-go is he thinks that his works, his good works will save him. We know that as Christians, that it is a gift. Salvation is a gift. It is not received through works, although it is proven that you are saved through your works. Your faith will produce good works. Um, but this is what's interesting. Uh, you know, when, when Jesus is asked, what's the greatest commandment, right? Uh, he tells them, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second greatest commandment is like this, love your neighbor as yourself. Why do you ask me what is good? Uh, one of the other ways that it could say is, why do you call me good? And he said to them, there is only one who is good. Obviously, it's Jesus, right? Not me, it's, it's Jesus. If you want to enter into life, keep the commands. Which ones? He asked them. Jesus answered, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear, bear false witness. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. I have kept all these, the young man told him. What do I still lack? If you want to be perfect, Jesus said to him, go sell your belongings and give them to the poor if, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When the young man heard that, he went away grieving because he had many possessions. Now I want to just point out a couple of scriptures. No. One of the commandments that you don't see mentioned here, but is the command that Jesus is actually, uh, I, I think these are the commands that Jesus is emphasizing, is one, have no other gods before me. This is one of the first 10 commandments, right? Have no other gods before me. Uh, one, and one of the things he says is don't make for yourselves a graven image. Uh, you can't serve two masters. This is something that Jesus heavily emphasizes in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, you also see that heavily emphasized in in uh, in Corinthians, where uh, and then love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul and strength. Uh, Jesus, God with us, is standing here saying, "Go sell your possessions and come follow me." This is going to lead to eternal life. Now, listen, he loved his money more than he loved god the god of the universe is standing in front of him telling him go sell your possessions and you will have life then come follow me give everything you have to follow me is what that that's how the disciples that are standing there is interpreting what he's saying that we left that's what they go on to say we left everything to follow you what's what's there going to be for us Jesus goes on to tell him, look, if, you, if you, anyone who's, who leaves their families, who leaves their houses, their homes, all these things, they will be blessed in the age to come, in the time to come when Jesus is sitting on his throne, uh, they will be blessed. Listen, uh, we, we don't have uh, time to get into all the rest of this, but I want you to, em to hear this emphasis that Jesus is making to this rich young man, that the God of the universe is standing before you and he is saying, come and follow me. Look, this is a plea to each and every one of us that we should not, dare not put money before Jesus, put money before the God of the universe. This guy walks away grieving like somebody died, broken hearted because he had many possessions. He loved his possessions more than he loved God. This guy could have been one of the 12. Like he probably would have been like 13. We would have called it 13. He called him to follow him. Come, follow me. Go get rid of everything you have. Sell it, give, it, give the money to the poor. Come follow me. 
He doesn't do it. He walks away grieving. I want to keep going, but I know I shouldn't. So um, I think that's, let's, let's, just let's pray. Let's do that. Lord, we come before you humbly and we just say, uh, Lord, some of us have put possessions in front of you. And some of us don't even have a ton of possessions. And yet those are so dear to us. Lord, help us to love you more. Help us not to serve two masters. Help us not to try to serve uh, you and mammon. Lord, you and money. Lord, help us to see you as the God of the universe that is standing in front of us, telling us, come, follow me. Lord, I, I pray that right now, if there's anybody watching this video that has anything going on, Lord, things that have crept in, uh, maybe they're not like this rich guy and, and you know, they've they've committed adultery or they've uh, said something bad about, uh, they've given a, a false witness. Lord, maybe they've broken one of those other rules. Lord, we, we pray that you'd forgive all of us. In Jesus' name. Amen. I, I want to close with this quick thought. Uh, the, the disciples go on to ask Jesus, who then can be saved? Because Jesus tells them it, it's super hard for somebody with wealth to be saved. And they say, who then can be saved? In summing it all up, Jesus replies with, with man, this is impossible. But with God, nothing is impossible. Listen, if you're watching this video, there's nothing impossible for God in your life. Submit to him. What is he asking you to do? Maybe you don't have a lot of possessions. Maybe Jesus isn't standing there asking you to sell everything you have and give it to the poor because you are the poor. You don't have anything to sell. Uh, but maybe there's something else. Maybe you need to give up something. Uh, maybe there's something that you've placed in a higher position in your life than Jesus. And he's saying, hey, that needs to come down off that throne and I need to get back up there in your life. I don't know. With God, it's in not impossible, sorry. <laughs> it, it, with God, nothing is impossible. All right, blessings. See you tomorrow.